Hi, my name is Crystal Oli. I'm a 17-year-old immigrant from Nigeria. I moved here with my family when I was six years old. Now that's a pretty special age to move to a new country. I wasn't old enough to find the adjustment to Canadian societal norms too difficult. Yet, I wasn't young enough to forget Nigeria as a whole either. Actually, I remember my life there quite clearly before we moved. Six is such a unique age to move to a new country because I can easily remember how different the people in the two countries looked. In Nigeria, the majority, if not all of the people I personally had come across were black. So when I moved to Canada and that wasn't the case, I wasn't necessarily shocked per se. I mean, I had been watching Western television. I was, however, under the illusion that my blackness would not influence my development. I mean, why would I ever consider that me being black would pose any problem? <laughs> I had never been exposed to racism, so as far as I was concerned, my blackness and my classmates' whiteness were akin to us having different hair colors. Different? Yes. Significant? No. So, like many other people of color, I began to have social experiences that made me hyper aware of my race. It's different for everyone. For some people, they get looked at funny in high-end stores because how could someone of that color possibly afford something so expensive? For others, they get completely ignored in academic settings because someone of their color couldn't possibly have anything constructive to contribute to the conversation. But for me, it was being told that I'm pretty for a black girl when I was 13 years old. Now, this might not sound too bad initially. I mean, they had just called me pretty, right? Wrong. I soon learned that this was not a compliment at all, as the second part of that statement turned the sentence from, I appreciate how you look, to, despite your skin color, you somehow managed to turn out okay looking. And while that may not comparatively have had an immediately detrimental effect as, say, racial profiling or being neglected in academic settings, for a 13-year-old girl who was just becoming more conscious of physical appearance and beauty standards, what comments like that did was perpetuate a social ideal that we have all subconsciously come to accept to some extent. Now, this experience is not unique to just me. In fact, as I get older, I have realized just how common compliments like these are. I also noticed that they seem to be especially reserved for girls with darker skin, who have smaller noses, colored eyes, thinner lips, etc. What society generally considers to be Eurocentric features. Now I use the term Eurocentric with a bit of hesitation and hopefully by the end of me standing here and talking for the next few minutes, you'll come to see why. Now to understand why the stipulation for a woman of color is so often added to compliment about appearance when it comes to women of color, I first looked at the usual suspects, the media. And I'm talking about all types of media, broadcast, print, support media, and of course, social media. I mean, this idea that race somehow defines the limit to which someone can be beautiful, didn't just fall out of thin air in the middle of the 21st century. It had to have come from somewhere. So while present day media can be shown to clearly be uplifting one race as the beauty standard, the same can be said for historical media. Right now, beauty standards are perpetuated by social media and print media, like magazines, for example. But a few years ago, the message was spread by public advertisement posters on every street corner. And even before then, well, it was books. All these things have influenced the thought process of the general public through the years to give us a visual representation or a literal description of what beautiful is. Now, when someone wants to explain the theory of evolution, they usually start from the past and work their way to the present. We're going to apply the same method here and see if we can fully understand why women of color always find themselves being complimented in backhanded ways that imply that finding beauty in our race is something outlandish. Don't worry, I won't bore you all with an intricate history lesson dating back to the 1400s about the development of beauty ideals. I will, however, mention writers like Christoph Mieners, who was a dedicated practitioner of scientific racism. Through his works, including a book by the title, The Outline of History of Mankind, he breaks down mankind into two distinct groups, beautiful and white, and ugly and black. 
This is a perfect example of how the idea that there is a superior race was and is perpetuated through the media. You might ask yourself, why in the world was something like this allowed to be published? Well, it was published because those who had the authority to do so had similar ideals concerning white racial superiority. And they were not just regular people. They were rich, they were powerful, they were white, and they were racist. And they had a clear understanding that we as human beings tend to associate beauty with goodness and value, as well as other positive connotations. Hence their decision that beauty simply could not be associated with darker skinned people. This is understandable considering that practices like slavery work specifically to dehumanize black people. Thus, publishing works that worked to further dehumanize people of color reduced the threats to white superiority by solidifying that no other race should be put at the same or at a higher level as the white majority. Now, moving forward through time, we still see this idea that black people are not to be considered beautiful being pushed forth through media such as plays in the early to mid 1800s, which would use blackface to hyperbolically represent the features of black people, likening us to monkeys, gorillas, and other similar animals. In the late 1900s though, we start to see the usage of the term pretty for a black girl. <laughs> Kelly Goff writes in an article published by The Cuts about the first black supermodel, Danya Luna. While recognized for her undeniable fierceness and elegance, Luna still found herself having to hide the features which made her too obviously black and present only her Eurocentric features. In her first cover for Harper's Bazaar, her race was intentionally covered as the cover was done in the form of a sketch, which prevented her skin color from being too obvious. Canadian author Alicia Liu writes about how the recent representation of darker skinned women in the beauty pageant world has opened the floor to discussions about featureism and colorism in that industry. The first Black Miss America, Vanessa Williams. Yes, very beautiful. But many have argued that women with what may be considered traditionally Black features may have potentially been met with more racially driven criticism than she was because of the idealization of Eurocentric features that exist in our society and how well her features allow her to fit into that ideal. While I in no way am intending to discredit the prejudice and racism these two women undoubtedly faced, reading about them did reveal something to me. I realized that while these women are both black, they were featured for their European resembling features as this is what deemed their ability to be accepted in the Western media as beautiful. Why? Well, because like I said, the teachings of Christoph Meners and many others like him didn't just filter themselves out through time. They became better hidden, more subtle, more incognito, more subconscious in our media. I noticed that the Western world has a skill for having its cake and eating it too. The best way to claim yourself to be a progressive nation while also maintaining your inherently racist ideals is to show representation in the media. But we often find that that representation still somehow uplifts Eurocentricism by dismissing and oftentimes demonizing colored women whose features are similar to those mocked during the Jim Crow era. Bigger noses, larger lips, big eyes. These features were and still are being looked at as less than beautiful. But Black women whose features conform to the Eurocentric ideal, such as having a small and straight nose and everything else I already mentioned, are seen as beautiful. Enough. Now I can see why people racialize their comments. What stipulations like for a Black girl implied to me is that although your skin color lowers your score on the beauty scale, your Eurocentric features bring you back up as they can easily be associated back to those shared amongst lighter races. I don't think I speak too bluntly when I say that this is a bad thing. The blaring truth is that there are no such things as Eurocentric or traditionally black features. If they are on my face and I am black, then for me, they are black features. If a white woman happens to have a larger nose, she's not said to have African features. She is simply said to have a larger nose. Featureism exists. It is deeply rooted in racist ideals and it is damaging, not only to the black community, not only to the brown community, but to our society as a whole. It blinds us to the abstract nature of beauty, giving us all tunnel vision to what we are allowed to find attractive. If nothing else I've said today stays with you all, please remember this. 
Beauty is too abstract a word to be defined. It is too vast to be compressed into one race. So when you leave here today, when you stop watching this video, look for someone who doesn't look like you. Look for someone whose beauty you see, regardless of what the societal definition of the word is, and remind them that they are beautiful. Because they are, and you are too. Thank you.